Welcome to the lecture for section 2.4. We're going to be looking at solutions and applications of right triangles. We're going to look at some background information about significant digits. Um, we're going to solve some triangles and then we're going to solve some application problems with angles of elevation and um, depression. So a lot of stuff about significant figures, especially in this course, is not um, very thorough or very clear. So I've added some more material that you don't find in your book here, just so you get a little bit better sense of what significant digits are. So any non-zero number is significant. Any zeros between two non-zero digits are also significant. Leading zeros are not significant. And trailing zeros to the right <coughs> of the decimal are significant and trailing zeros in a whole number but only when the decimal is shown are significant. These are really important um, and basic rules that I think can help you determine um, which digits are significant and which are not. So some of the basic things are um, the first rule is that all non-zero digits in a measurement are significant which we already saw that and zeros that appear between non-zero digits. You might think of these as middle zeros. They're always significant. And zeros that appear, appear in front of the non-zero digits are called leading zeros. Okay. <clears throat> a significant digit is a digit obtained by actual measurement. This is some of the historical. And here you can see some uh, significant digits in the following numbers. Um, these are the ones, but bold. Notice that 7300 at the far right, the two um, following zeros, trailing zeros, are not considered significant because there's no decimal point. But here on the far left, 4080, 4080, the last zero is significant because there's a decimal point in the answer. Okay. The trailing zeros in 6.7 are considered significant, but the leading zeros are not. Okay. <clears throat> when you're um, looking to determine the number of significant digits for answers and applications of angle measure, this is some just general insight. If your angles are to the nearest degree, um, answer to two significant digits. If your angle is measured to the nearest 10 minutes or 10th of a degree, use three digits to the nearest minute or nearest hundredth use four significant digits, and if it's to the nearest 10 seconds or nearest thousandth of a degree, use five digits. Significant digits is not such a big part of this course. Um, it's certainly much more prevalent in chemistry, etc., cetera, um, and you'll have more instruction in those kind of courses. When we solve a triangle, and this should just say A triangle, not AA triangle, <clears throat> what this means is to find the measures of all the angles and all the sides, okay? It's a good idea to label a triangle. And notice when we label the triangle, the um, capital or uppercase letters are the angles, and the lowercase letters are the sides, the lengths of the sides. And um, they are um, identified or labeled such that um, the side opposite the angle is the same letter. Okay, so you can see side A is opposite angle A, side B is opposite angle B, etc. <clears throat> and typically, because of Pythagorean's theorem, we reserve the hypotenuse um, for letter C, because A squared plus B squared equals C squared. So we just typically use C for the hypotenuse. <clears throat> so let's look at a triangle here. We, um, we have a right triangle, ABC. We have a measure for A and a measure for side C. We have a measure for angle A and a measure for side C. Okay, so we still have to find the measures for angle B, for angle C, and um, for sides A and B. Okay, so notice <clears throat> we have angle A and we have the hypotenuse. If we want to find the side A, this is the side opposite angle A, 
So we have the opposite and the hypotenuse. Well, soa, I'm sorry, so, so katoa, so sine opposite over hypotenuse, we can use the sine function to find this. So the sine of a equals side a over side c. If we plug in the numbers, we can then calculate the length of sine a using our calculator. And we get approximately 7.19 inches. <clears throat> if we want to find side b, notice this is the side adjacent to the angle over the hypotenuse, and that is cosine. Cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. So we get cosine of a equals b over c, plug in the values, and then calculate b, and we get that side b is roughly 10.5 inches. <clears throat> we know that side, excuse me, angle c is 90 degrees because it has the square in it, and so we can find side b by just recognizing that a and b have to be complementary because this is also 90. So b is going to be equal to 90 minus a, or 55 degrees and 30 minutes. Okay. So in all of these, you're going to be trying to figure out how do you solve um, the different sides and different angles with the trig functions that you have. Notice in this problem, we could have found the measure of angle B first and then used the trig value, function values of B to find the unknown sides. This would have worked in this problem and you wouldn't have had, um, and you would have had the same answers. But sometimes when you do that, um, it causes a rounding effect, and so your answers are skewed slightly. So it's always just best to use the given information as much as possible instead of any calculated information, just to avoid um, any rounding errors that might be caused. All right, let's try another one here. It's a good time to maybe hit the pause button and try this on your own. Here we are given two sides, and we have to find the third side and then also the three angles, A, B, and C. Of course, angle C is already known as a 90 degree angle. <clears throat> so if you want to, since we, let's look at side A, or excuse me, angle A. Angle A equals opposite, the sine of A, excuse me, equals the um, side opposite over the hypotenuse, so, uh, so sine opposite hypotenuse, so we can find angle A using the sine function, right? Plug in those values. And then with our calculator, we take the inverse sine, the inverse sine um, calculation. Inverse sine is the um, function above the sine button on your calculator. And so you hit the blue second button and then the sine to the negative one. And that you can see here. So if we take the inverse sine, this is going to give us the angle, and we get approximately 33.32. Well, 0.32 degrees is the same as 19 minutes. <clears throat> Once we have um, angle A, we can easily find angle B, recognizing that they're complementary because of a triangle, right? Then we have a right triangle. So we, we subtract angle A from 90 degrees to get angle B, and we get 56 degrees and 41 minutes. To find side B, we can use Pythagorean's theorem. A squared plus B squared equals C squared. Plugging in the values and then solving for B, we get B equals the square root of 2004, etc., which is approximately 44.77 centimeters. Okay, so these are pretty straightforward. Just think of, look at what you have and then think in terms of angles. Think of the trig functions that you have to find one of the three, and then the other you can use the complementary rule for a right triangle. Okay. We're also looking today at angles of elevation, and this is when you're going uphill, if you will, when you're looking at something above the horizon, if you will. And angles of depression is when you're looking down, like maybe into a valley, uh, et cetera. Notice this is not the same as the resistance force that we looked in before, where one is positive and one is negative. Both of these angles um, here are actually measured in a positive direction. Okay, so um, it's just important to remember that um, the angle of elevation, it's kind of like you're standing on 
on the ground, and that's your initial um, uh, side of the angle. And then your terminal side is you're looking up. And again, here, the, the angle of depression, you're kind of standing on the ground, but you're looking down. And so it's that lower angle that you're measuring there. Be careful when interpreting the angle of depression. Both the angle of elevation and the angle of depression are measured between the, li the line of sight and a horizontal line. So a lot of times when we're uh, building diagrams, and in fact one of the examples we're going to look at is very common, um, most of the diagrams we build are going to be to create triangles. Well, if you're thinking about the angle of depression, a lot of times that angle is outside of the triangle. So you have to use things like um, parallel, the transversal of the parallel lines and the alternate interior, alternate exterior angles, etc. to figure out what's going on instead of just assuming it's the angle inside the triangle. When we're doing these um, angle of elevation problems, you definitely want to draw a sketch. If you, if you can't visualize it, it's going to be very hard to solve the problem. Um, take your time, draw each piece of the sketch as you're coming to it, um, and then it'll be much easier. A lot of students um, tend to read the whole thing and then can't figure out how to start. They can't even figure out how to sketch because they're trying to figure out what the entire picture looks like. So think of this more like dot to dot and draw one piece at a time. And I'm going to kind of um, talk you through that in the examples. Then once you have the sketch, um, use the sketch to write an equation relating the given quantities to the variable or what you're looking for. Solve the equation and check that your answer makes sense. Um, make sure um, in step one when you're drawing the sketch you also um, label the variable, which is typically the question you're trying to solve, like how tall is something, how far away is something, etc. All right, so let's look at a problem. Example three, find a, finding a length given by an angle of elevation. Okay, so this is, uh, imagine standing on the ground and we're looking up. In fact, we're looking to the top of a flagpole. <clears throat> so what I want to do is I want to read this slowly and as I get a piece of information, I want to start drawing it at point A, which is 123 feet from the base of a flagpole. Stop. Okay, all I'm going to do is draw a straight line across, a horizontal line. I'm going to label it as 123 feet. On one end, I'm going to put A, because that's point A. And the other end, I'm going to draw a flagpole. Well, a flagpole will go in the air. Okay, so right now all I have is an angle. I have a right angle, I have the ground, and something going straight up, the flagpole. The angle of elevation to the top of the flagpole is 26 degrees 40 minutes. Well now I'm going to connect this and make it a triangle from point A to the top of the flagpole, and now I can label that angle A with 26 degrees 40 minutes. Okay. And this is what it would look like. Again, I drew, drew first this line from point A to this flagpole and labeled it 123. I then drew my flagpole in there. It then said the um, angle for um, the angle of elevation. So I knew that was from point A to the top of the flagpole, as it says there. So I connected those dots and now have a triangle. And I labeled the angle A with 26 degrees 40 minutes. I'm trying to find the height of the flagpole, so I'm going to label that. I'm going to label it with lowercase a because it's opposite angle a. So notice what I have is the opposite side and the adjacent side. Opposite and adjacent and the angle. So in order to find um, this measure of the height, I'm going to use tangent. Tangent equals the opposite over the adjacent. So I can set up an equation that the tangent of a equals lowercase a over 123. I multiply both sides by 123, get my calculator out, and I see that the flagpole is approximately 61.8 feet. One of the most important parts of this is taking your time and drawing the diagram so that I can see the triangle, I can see the angles and the sides, and then I can figure out my formula based on what I'm given and what I'm looking for. 
In this case, again, we had an angle and we knew the side opposite and the side adjacent. Well, what things relate an angle to opposite and adjacent? That is the tangent. So let's try another problem. See if you can draw this. I would recommend that you actually hit pause and try to draw this from the top of a 210 foot cliff. Stop. Here I want to draw a cliff. Well, what is a cliff? It's not a hill. It's a drop off. So I'm just going to drop, draw a line straight up and down and I'm going to label it 210. From the top of the cliff, David observes a lighthouse that is 430 feet offshore. So the cliff, I assume, is right on the shoreline. It doesn't say that, but I think that's a fair assumption. And from the base of the, of the cliff, which is where the shoreline is, where the ocean or water is, we go offshore 430 feet. So we have a line straight down, which is the cliff. And now we're going to draw another line out to the lighthouse and maybe draw a little picture of a lighthouse or something. And this bottom line, this horizontal line, we're going to label as 430. Find the angle of depression from the top of the cliff to the base of the lighthouse. On the top of the cliff, we've got this kind of L-shaped drawing so far. If we connect those two ends, notice that we have a triangle. But this is where we often go wrong. We say, ha ha, so that upper angle from the cliff um, between the cliff and that line is the angle of depression. This angle, but that would be wrong. And this is the common mistake that we make when solving these types of problems is we say we see the triangle and we automatically assume that this angle that we're looking for is the one inside the triangle. But it's not, okay? It's remember the angle of elevation, you have to draw a horizontal line and it's the angle between that horizontal line and your line of sight as you're looking down, okay? <clears throat> so we have to remember that, and again, this is a very common mistake. Most students with this specific problem even um, think of this angle as the angle of depression, which is incorrect. But notice that we have two parallel lines, the seawater and the um, line that comes off the top of the cliff, and we have a transversal. So technically, we have um, alternate interior angles. The angle of depression will be the same measure as angle B, okay, because of alternate interior angles. So if we find the angle B, we will also be able to find um, the angle of depression because they're equal. Here, if we're looking at angle B, notice that we have the side opposite and the side adjacent just like we did in the last problem, so we're going to use the tangent function. The tangent of the opposite side 210 over the adjacent side 430 gives us, um, again, we're going to need to use inverse tangent to find the angle. So inverse tangent of that gives us an angle of 26 degrees, which is the angle of depression. Okay, that's the end of today's lecture. It's pretty short. Hopefully this is helpful to you, and um, I'll see you in the next lecture.